One of the most common issues any high-performing climber will encounter is the balance between adequate recovery as well as muscle gain. But now what if I told you that might not be the case anymore? This is me as I met Dr. Keith Barr in real life for the very first time. So there we go. Now I'm a researcher. <laughs> uh, today I'm joined by Keith. He's a professor in molecular exercise physiology and an author of a review paper titled Minimizing Injury and Maximizing Return to Play, a lesson from engineered ligaments, which in short states that 10 minutes of activity every six hours is a key to improving healthy connective tissues and creating longevity in athletes. Today we'll hear what he has to say. These ones are ACL cells. Um, for right now, they're from an older individual, but it, it seems like... But that's going to be in a few minutes, because first I want to let you know why I traveled to the Kingdom of the Netherlands to visit Keith in his laboratory. So there's more of the cells there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Three years ago, I posted a video showing some insane finger strength gains that I had by training on a hangboard. <laughs> now that's nothing too uncommon for us climbers, but what was surprising was the method I used, which involved training two times per day for 30 days straight. Now this may sound like way too much of a load, but hear me out and maybe you'll understand why it may be kind of a game changer. So the method I used was to train my fingers with about 40% of what I could maximally hold for 5 to 10 seconds. I would hold this with varying grip types for 10 seconds each, with about 50 second rest in between each of the no-hacks. I would continue this for a total of 10 minutes, and it basically feels like a light stretch in my fingers and forearms. So if I wanted to, I could probably do this protocol all day without actually reaching fatigue. I measured my hang time and strength on different edges in the gym before and after the 30 days that I did this for, and I found a shocking increase in strength from it, across the board with every hang type that I tried. In fact, my results were so surprising that I burst out laughing after a couple of the hangs. <laughs> This protocol was based on the recommendations by Dr. Barr, although he had used the recommendations to recover injured ligaments. I instead intended to use this protocol to improve my already healthy fingers to be able to climb more. But to my surprise, I saw a strength increase that I had never seen before with my, at the time, nine years of training. In sports science, this would seem very contradictory to see maximum strength benefits from, which is why despite my surprising results, I was very adamant about not recommending this protocol to anyone else, since it was really only me and my brother Felix who had tried it so far, meaning that there's no statistical relevance in the results that I saw. It could have just been a result of a bunch of different factors, like resting from other types of training or just staying more active. We really don't know for sure. However, I can't argue that it wasn't interesting and I've been very curious to find out more ever since. And finally, I have. <laughs> You see, a little over a year ago, I received an email from Keith Barr who thanked me for posting the video and asked if I ever wanted to chat about science and how he would modify the training protocol to fit better into climbing. And if we fast forward through some very interesting calls, well, then we'll make it to today's video where I will be presenting a retrospective study that I've done together with the very same Dr. Keith Barr, Natalie Gilmore, and the creator of the Crimped app, Peter Klimek. Now, with full disclosure, I have not written much in this paper, and instead I want to give the credit where it's due. Uh, I'm kind of the Dumbo in the middle of it all, who gets to work with all of these wonderful and brilliant minds. So I just want to give a big thank you to Keith, Natalie and Peter for making all of this happen. All the information you'll find in this video is very, very largely thanks to them. Uh, so yeah, nothing but thanks and gratitude towards them. Anyway, on to the action. Last year, after discussing the protocol with a physio called Kalle, and concluding that there are no obvious negative effects to performing the protocol, we put it in the Crimped app and it has since been logged over half a million times. When we started the study, it was few in that, but it was still well over 100,000 entries that we could filter the data from. So what we did is we compared how the average strength gain in finger strength improved when compared to different ways to train as climbers. The first group that we looked at consisted of people who did only climbing, but had done two max finger strength tests. In other words, these people reported no finger training on a hangboard of any kind. The second group were people who performed the golden standard for max finger strength training, and these are called max hangs. Conventionally speaking, these are the way to train finger strength in climbing. And that's why we wanted to compare the no hang protocol that my brother invented to, well, what is the golden standard? The reason for this is that max hangs work very similar to when we want to improve our max strength in the gym. We load up close to our max and go for a short duration and hopefully that will improve our strength. The third group we had was people who did only the no hangs. These are referred to as Abrahangs in the study. As mentioned earlier, a light stretch in the forearms or about 40% of what you can maximally hold. 
but always below body weight is the expected load from this category. And lastly, we wanted to see how people who did both the no hang and the max hangs were affected in order to find out whether or not these could be combined or detrimental towards your gains. So based on these different categories, it was time to start filtering out the data and figure out which of the users we could have in this study. And once we'd understood that, it was time to check in with Keith to see what our results actually were. If we go in and, and, and compare to climbers, so mm -hmm. people who just climb, not surprisingly, well, maybe a little bit surprisingly, they don't actually increase their finger strength with time. Mm -hmm. But people who incorporate the Abrahangs in with their climbing, their maximum hang for, for five seconds, went up by about 2.5%. Mm. And this is across a large number of people. This is hundreds of people. The people who did max hangs, their, their increase in finger strength or in their in their max hang capacity only went up 3.2%. And there's no statistical difference between those two groups. Mm -hmm. In short, this means that we can either do the max hangs or the no hangs to improve our finger strength, which seems rather contradictory to regular beliefs, especially since maximum load has been kind of a cornerstone in traditional fitness training. And this of course begs the question, what does this mean for the science world? So that's really exciting for us as, as physiologists, exercise yeah. physiologists, because the way that we've always said is strength comes from lifting a heavy weight. Right. And so you can increase muscle mass. So if I want to make my biceps bigger, I can lift any weight as long as I go to failure. Mm. But if I want to get my muscle as strong as possible, I need to lift as heavy as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that we've always thought about it. But in this situation where we're doing something that is maybe more tendon centric, mm. what we're seeing is that your performance, your strength is actually going up exactly the same mm. with something that uses a part, par, only part of your body weight versus something that uses you know, your body weight plus extra weight. Right. And so the, the, the weight component or the, the strength component is, is still the same between those. Mm. And the most interesting aspect for us is that when you combine both the Abrahangs with the Max Hangs, now you actually get an additive effect. That's right. When we looked at people who had done both the max hangs and the no hangs, we saw an increase in strength as if the fatigue didn't matter and didn't affect them at all. Now for context, imagine that you're doing some really, really heavy lifts in the gym. You start off in the morning and then you just rest a few hours and you go in for a second session. You wouldn't expect to get any additional gains from that. You would expect to get completely destroyed and, and tired and ultimately you'd see negative gains rather than positive ones. More importantly, you wouldn't expect your gains to be doubled. And with that being said, I had to find out would the recommendation be to do both or to pinpoint what you think is good for you and then do that? So it's always about that first group, the climbing group. Right. So if your climbing has lots of dynamic moves where you're doing lots of really quick holds and you're maybe dropping some and you've got a lot okay. of dynamic mm -hmm. load, maybe adding more dynamic load like a max hang is going to be too much. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we would use something that's more a mag, uh, an Abraham. So that if you're going to have really dynamic moves, mm -hmm. then what we have to do in the gym is we have to give you the other stimulus. And that's what I always try and tell strength coaches and performance coaches. If your sport is all really high jerk moves, really plyometric moves, lots of accelerations, decelerations. I don't need that in the gym. I'm getting that on the field or on the court. Right. So on the court, you're getting that. I'm going to give you the other thing, which is the kind of health-based movement. Wow. If you're, say, a swimmer or a rower or a cyclist, and you don't have any plyometric and you very low plyometric load, now maybe incorporating that in the gym might be useful. Right. Same thing is true here. If you've got somebody who's doing very slow climbs where they're just, where they're in contact with the wall for long periods of time, they're holding a long period of time, adding more Abrahams maybe is just not really gonna do much right. for them, where maybe for them a max hang would be better. You know, just climbing is great, but you're not improving. Doing either one of the two types of hangs alone, you're improving, but when you do them together and you get this almost exact additive effect, what that suggests is that there is there are different benefits from the two, and when you put them together, it gives you something even more. Wow. And so really, I, 
if we think of it as the max hang is working the muscle in the nervous system and the abrahang is working the force transmission in the connective tissue right. now when we put it all together those are the three components of strength and so yes if if person isn't injured doing both of them is probably going to be the best outcome for at least for finger strength for their ability to improve this one measure right i mean that's pretty fascinating right it kind of blew my mind when we started seeing these results. And I personally think what Keith mentioned in the end is quite a fascinating point. In reality, what we want to target is what we're needing for our finger strength gains. So if you're like me, for instance, who is a very dynamic climber, I jump around between the holds, I regularly cut loose, then maybe the no hangs is a protocol that could be implemented into your training to see some finger strength gains. However, if you do stay on the wall for long durations of times, so maybe you do multi-pitch or maybe you just do uh, long routes, then maybe max hangs should be the thing that you're adding to your training. We can, of course, increase the load. We can add more and more and more, but you will need to be careful to make sure you're not overdoing your training. And I think this is a specific important topic regarding the no hang protocol because it is originally designed to help you have healthier fingers, not to increase your finger strength. So once you put that component into play and you're trying to just get those finger strength gains, you might be overdoing it. And I think it's incredibly important to make sure that the load is kept as light as possible. Because all the research that we have, it doesn't suggest that you should try and push your fingers as hard as possible. It basically just means that you need to activate your, your cells, your tendons, your connective tissue once every six hours to see these benefits. Another important thing to note is that this is a retrospective study, which means that it has a lot of limitations. For starters, the data we collected is uncontrolled. We do not know what all the users did exactly the loads they were putting into their fingers. We didn't know if they were logging everything correctly. There are a lot of errors within all of this um, that we can't control. Everything you've heard here, it just means that we have signs pointing towards finger strength gains from this light load, but nothing conclusive. Another point of interest is that we had to have a quite an open window because people who regularly climb or only climb usually don't do a lot of finger strength tests. Uh, so the window at which you could perform this test was quite large, which can have its, its drawbacks as well. What we did find out though, is that this showed that training frequently with low weight increased finger strength to the same extent as training with max strength hangboard training. And that's quite a fascinating starting point for all of this research. However, because of all of these limitations, we're looking into creating a prospective study to further work on this research. That basically just means we'll be looking to make it a lot more controlled and, and be able to compare things and know exactly what's been going on behind the scenes as well. And as a first step, we've created a visa C for climbing injuries, which you can find in the description down below. So if you want to take part in the prospective study and help us understand more about finger health and strength, well, then you know where to find it. I will, of course, be posting all of the results from this as well as the full prospective study. If you've watched this far uh, and you haven't already subscribed, I would really appreciate it if you did. I will be posting the full talk that I had with Keith later on uh, in a month or two, which contains just an endless amount of fantastic knowledge around tendon health and, and connective tissue and some stuff that would fascinate most people interested in sports science, I believe. I'd also like to add that uh, the protocol will be in the Crimped app. And if you search for Emil, I'm sure you'll find it quite easily. So yeah, if you want to dive in a little bit more in depth into all of this research, you will be able to find the actual paper, which has now been published in the link in the description down below, as well as a link to the podcast that I did together with Ryan Devlin and Keith Barr, where we went really in depth on all of this. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for watching and I'm looking forward to working more with this.